About seven years, I would get together with two other ladies every Friday night. We'd eat spaghetti and drink sparkling juice. We'd pour out our hearts, confess sin, and pray for each other. It was such an important friendship that provided encouragement and accountability. The group was made up of Amy, who is white, Lillian, who is Chinese, and me. And a lot of people might say, it's great that you could all be colorblind and get together like that. But I don't think that's what it was. I think the term colorblind is well-intentioned, but in our group, it's not that we were blind to our differences. Instead, we appreciated our differences. If you're colorblind, you miss out on the beauty of the world God's made. Look at the flowers He's created, all the various types of colors, we celebrate those differences because they reflect God's beauty and creativity. He also created a variety of people, and I think we need to rejoice in that diversity. We know that in eternity, people from every tribe and nation will come together. But I think we can start seeing that happen now in the body of Christ. It amazes me that we are one, brothers and sisters adopted into the family of God. The gospel unites us. It breaks down the barriers that separate us. So I think all of us need to ask, how does the gospel affect race? What does it mean that we are all created in the image of God and we're all redeemed equally? And then once you understand a theology of race, what does it look like particularly in the church? I think a lot of pastors want to figure that out but we're still not where we want to be. How does a theology of race affect your home, the people you invite in, your community? I think that the accountability group that I met with can be a small picture of what the church could look like on a wider scale. That we will have a greater vision for what the church could be. That the world will look at the church and see the beauty and diversity of God's creation and that they will be amazed by the power of the gospel to make us united. Hello, hello, welcome. Welcome to our weekly teaching. That was Trulia Newbell. She is the author of United, Captured by God's Vision for Diversity. Now I haven't read her book, but I, I came across her, her website and I think that uh, video really summarizes nicely one of the main points I was trying to make last week that our, our call is not to be colorblind, but to, to see the, the beauty that God has made in our various ethnicities. And I also like her challenge about looking at who's at your table. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Now, there is a neighborhood Facebook page, a, a group page. And um, if you're in the neighborhood, you can comment on it. You can leave recommendations. Um, there's reminders about various events. There's crime alerts. It's basically a community bulletin board. You're, you're aware. You know how it works. Uh, and sometimes it's, it's very helpful. Other times, not so much. Uh, last month, there was a, a post that led to a heated dialogue. And the group moderator had to end up shutting down the comments because it was getting uh, so... Um, their comments were getting so aggressive towards towards one another and and the post really it resolved around racial expectations and the gist of it was that there was a man he was, he was walking his dog a dog that was either a pit bull or it looked like a pit bull you know with the, the larger head um, and the dog was off leash the dog aggressively chases a cat up a tree a lady comes out of her house and tells the man that the dog needs to be leashed. And he, he's unable to control the dog. And according to the lady, the, the man makes, in her words, a rampage of threats. Again, those, that's, that's her, her words. And, and uh, tells her that she doesn't belong in the neighborhood and calls her a dumb 
white. Seize your imagination. Uh, the man makes then makes a, a gun motion and, and fires said handgun and, um, and and says I'm I'll come back later to take care of you. Uh, she calls 911. The man leashes a dog and walks away. The lady is white. The man is black. And immediately, we've all formed opinions. And the beautiful thing about social media is that you can insert your opinion whether you have all the facts or not. Right? You, you, we have put in our mind how it went down and who was the aggressor in this situation. And that's exactly what happened in this circumstance. People began to, to put in comments and, um, and there was a variety of comments for sure. Uh, some were talking about a white woman being scared by, by a black man. Uh, they were, um, some were talking about false accusations leading to, to black men in prison. And some were saying this wasn't a race issue at all but one human being threatening another human being. And after 125 comments, the moderator shut it down. And I'm so glad I live in 2023 when we no longer have to deal with uh, racism, racial tensions, injustice, and they've just all been eradicated. Yeah, right, wouldn't that be nice? And, and if I had the, the uh, the know-how, I would drop an anvil on my head right now to say, yeah, yeah, right, stop it, Matthew. But this this back and forth on Facebook, it's it's nothing new. It, it happens from time to time on the neighborhood side. It happens all over the place. Now we're in the middle of a series called One Blood, looking at God's desire for a multi-ethnic church. And by now, you know something about our church, about our, our mission uh, statement that we, we say every week. And, and if you're still around, if you're still part of the Hills Church, if you're watching this, I just want to, to commend you. I, I want to say I'm, I'm proud of you for sticking in this, this conversation. It is so much easier to just step away, to, to get back into our comfort zone, hang out with people who, who think like us and that grew up like us, and we just have, we share so much in common with. It is much harder to stay in this conversation. And so I, I want to commend you. I, it, it, is, it is something, and it's not something uh, that everyone can do. And, and um, so, so thank you for, for staying in the, the conversation. Um, and I would say that, that it is, this does take work, but it's worth it. It is worth it. I think in, in my own life how I have benefited from, from being in cross-cultural relationships, especially amongst believers and how it's helped me grow in my faith and helped me see blind spots and, and helped me love Jesus better, hearing other people's stories and experiences. And um, I think as a, as a church, it's a picture of, of God's kingdom and, and our neighborhood. I believe, I truly believe that our, our church could be an avenue for healing, for the, the brokenness along the racial divides that have long been part of the history of our, our neighborhood. Um, so there, there is some, some pain along the way. There is some, some pain in these conversations. But I know that in the end, it will lead to life. So let me just briefly get us up to speed. I've been reminding us as, as we're going, and, and you should have it down by now. Uh, but we, we set the theological foundation. We looked at the prayer of Jesus, pattern in Acts. We looked at the Pauline mystery. And if you missed any of those, you can go back and, and catch those online. Uh, last week, we said that unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean uniformity. And God created our ethnicities, and we don't give them up when we, we come to follow Jesus. And that should keep us clear of any talk of, of being colorblind. On the other hand, our ultimate identity is in Christ. And, and so what that means is, is that we see life through the lens of the cross and not through the lens of our race and ethnicity, though that plays into it. And so it's this, this balance that we're, we're trying to, to walk as, as Jesus followers. But let's jump in today. We're gonna look at Ephesians, back in Ephesians again. Ephesians chapter four, verse one. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Some translations there say, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. Walk worthy. 
walk worthy. That, that's a, a uh, I've heard sermons around that. In fact, uh, just today, I was on social media and I saw an advertisement for a men's conference that was called Walk Worthy. Walk Worthy. So, so this is not an unfamiliar phrase. And, uh, but what does it mean to live a life worthy of the calling? And at the most basic level, we have pledged our life to follow Jesus and our life should match. Like we should walk worthy of that, that calling. And if you remember the previous chapters in Ephesians, which we've, we've looked at briefly in the previous weeks, they're speaking of the mystery of the gospel. That, that is that, that we are one new humanity. So in context, walking in a manner worthy of the calling is in some way linked with the call for Jewish and Gentile believers to love one another, to walk, work, and worship God together in and through the local church for the sake of the gospel. So, so in some way, walking worthy has to do with how we live out our faith in a cross-cultural context. How do we walk worthy? How do we do that? How do we achieve that? Paul helps us the next verse. So again, verse 1, As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Paul, how do we, how do we walk as, as one new humanity, how do we walk worthy? And he's like, simple. Humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance. And, and not, like it doesn't say just be kind of humble, sort of humble, but completely humble. Uh, most Greek writers do not view humility. In, in the first century, humility was not a virtue. In fact, the only people who were supposed to demonstrate humility were servants. Or slaves, that was their place to, to be humility to to uh, to go down, because that was their their station in life. However, in Jesus, that term has been redeemed through through the cross. It's okay to go down, because Jesus went down. It's okay to to lay our lives down for others, because Jesus laid his life down. For us, he gave up his rights. He gave up his privileges, and and there's a whole sermon right right there for sure. But Jesus went down so that we could go up. So humility, it's admitting weaknesses, admitting our, our personal limits. It's it's the opposite of pride. In fact, pride promotes disunity. Pride dismo- uh, promotes disunity. Humility promotes unity. Humility promotes unity because pride gives no room for, for other viewpoints. Pride doesn't ask questions. Uh, pride isn't, isn't curious. Pride doesn't, doesn't listen. Humility. Humility does that. Humility takes responsibility. Humility listens. And, and gentleness. And this, this is the opposite of self-assertion or rudeness, of harshness. Because you can be right and true and not be gentle and not be gentle. Patience. Patience is, is that spirit that, that never gives up. It doesn't walk away, that, that stays in the conversation. It, it can mean endurance in the face of suffering, even. And a reluctance to avenge wrongs. Oh, that, that's good. Patience, a reluctance to avenge wrongs. Forbearance, uh, it doesn't say forbearance in what we read, but bearing with one another. It almost has the idea of putting up with someone. Like just kind of put up with them in love, in love. But these are the values, these are the attitudes required for us as we pursue being a multi-ethnic church, of living a multi-ethnic Christian life. Because relationships, like if we don't have these, if, if we don't have humility, if we don't have gentleness and patience and forbearance, like it is going to be near impossible. For us to be a multi-ethnic church, to lean into cross-cultural relationships, because relationships are hard. Even when, even when we're very similar. Uh, Elora and I have been married for almost 19 years, and we come from similar backgrounds. We come from similar uh, faith traditions. Um, just that there were a lot of similarities, and and yet 19 years in, sometimes, like, like how. I want to, to be a good husband. I want to communicate well. And sometimes I wish, you know, that as we're communicating, we also had like thought bubbles <laughs> that we could, you know, that the other person could read and we could read. And, and I have read 
man, I've read books, Crucial Conversations. That's one of my favorites. Crucial com- I've read it three times. That's probably time to, to read it again. I've read marriage books. And I've read I've read the Bible. Like I, I've prayed. And like after all, I'm like, I was preparing today, I was thinking, man, I am I must be dense. Because <laughs> I guess it's, it's make the same old mistakes. I I say like I I say something that I think is a very uh, innocuous kind of statement, and it's like, Poof. I'm like, where did that where did that come from? I don't I don't know. Um, and I I'm kind of being lighthearted, but I mean it's true because what I say and intend isn't always what is heard and interpreted, and vice versa. And this is when we're on like the same, same level, okay? Like, um, as as far as like our, our background goes, you you add in different backgrounds and different expectations and different experiences. Like, ah, uh, like Paul, give us give us some help here. In a multi ethnic church, there is one hundred percent chance of being offended at some point along the way. That's there is a 100% chance that at some point in the Hills Church, you will be offended. Someone is going to say something. Someone is going to do something. Uh, some, someone is going to ask a question that in the question itself is, is offensive. Uh, one time I was at my kid's elementary school, and I can't remember what the exact event was, but we were, we were outside, like on the, on the black top, and the parents and the kids and like everyone's it must have been some some type of festival or something going on and and this this young black man uh, I say a man like fourth grade child uh, walks past me and he had just had an interaction off to the side that I was not involved in I was just there minding my own business I, I'd seen the kid around I didn't really know him but as he's walking by me under his breath he mumbles not too quietly he's like Ugh, white people <laughs> you know, it's this little kid. The principal, who is a, a black man, was also standing nearby, heard him. He's like, hey, hey, hey. Pulls him over, has a conversation with the young man. The young man comes back, and even though those words weren't directed towards me, I heard the words, and he apologized. There, there is a 100% chance of being offended at some point along the way. And, and I guess like in our, in our church, we've tried to create an environment uh, that, that is, is open and that is, is safe. And so uh, I think the, the offenses, for the most part, will be unintentional. But they'll still be offensive nonetheless. And, and what do we do when that happens? We walk worthy. We walk with humility, gentleness, patience, forbearance because this this is hard this is hard and and communication is, is much more than just meets the eye we we think of communication as, as the things in the conversation that we we see and, and we hear but there's so much going on under the surface it's like it's like an iceberg it's like this iceberg where the things we can see the things we can hear the things we, we can we can touch above you know, above the surface and below the surface are all those other, the internal, the implicitly learned, the unconscious, the difficult to change, the subjective knowledge, our beliefs, our values, our, our thought patterns, our, our myths. And so in cross-cultural communications, it's often the things that lie beneath the surface, things that are unsaid, that we bring into the conversation. And, and so we're, we're trying to communicate, and when we have underlying histories and, and the other person has underlying values that we may not know about and just one example let's say a, a dinner guest removes his shoes upon entering the host's home and in the guest culture taking your shoes off is considered uh, respectful to the host and leaving them on would, would be rude in the host culture this action is considered presumptuous even disrespectful in such a situation, without understanding each other, both parties could be hurt. And it all happens because of the unspoken, below-the-surface background kind of stuff. And this is why we need humility. This is why we need gentleness and patience and forbearance. We're, we're going to need some patience when, when somebody offends us. We're going to need patience. And in our worldview... It causes communication to, to get complex, especially when we add in that cross-cultural component. 
because we, we act according to our, our values and norms. And again, that person hearing that, and they, they, they are receiving it in their cultural values and norms. So this is um, just another example, and this is from the book Multi-Ethnic uh, Conversations by Onaya Okuwobi and Mark Dimas, co-authors. But this is an example that they use of this. A white person taking a flight may assume that if a black flight attendant is somehow inattentive, she, the black flight attendant, fits a stereotype of a black person with a chip on her shoulder. In fact, the flight attendant may have received devastating news from home and be too upset to be as courteous as she would have been otherwise. Remaining conscious of our worldview and understanding that others have their own as well can help us exercise more patience and achieve more clarity in communicating cross-culturally with others. Cross cultural relationships will stretch us. Cross-cultural relationships will stretch us. And it's like Paul's instructions to the Ephesians. It assumes that the Gentiles and the Jews are, in fact, spending time with one another. Like, he, he doesn't tell them to spend time with one another. It's like that's assumed. What he assumes is when they're doing that, they are going to need humility. That they are going to need gentleness and patience and forbearance because if they're not spending time together then you don't need you don't need those things right you don't need the only if you're spending time together and, and I think for us that that we need to be intentionally developing cross-cultural relationships we need to intentionally pursue cross-cultural relationships uh, it, the hills as, as a church as in in total is becoming a more diverse church. We look around on Sundays when, when we gather, we now have uh, less than 50% white people of make up our, our total uh, numbers as, as a church. And, uh, and I, I don't check them all the time, but once in a while I just wanna check in and see, see where we are. And, and I think that's a great start. But if that's all it ever is, is just Sunday mornings when we're gathered together, we're diverse, and then we go throughout the week and, and we're, we're still separated. Uh, you could say segregated, separated, then I, I don't think that's, that's our call. I don't think that's what we see here in, in the New Testament. And um, So like who, who is in your social circle? Who do you spend time with? Who do you seek uh, advice from? With whom have you shared a meal recently? And we have our, our five missional habits that we talk about, our, our bells, right? We, we bless one person a week. We share a meal with someone every week. We listen to the Holy Spirit. We learn something about Jesus. We live sent. And, and these are simple, yet transformational habits that, that we want to embrace. And, you know, we, we talk about blessing and, and sharing a meal with people. And, and, and that's, if you want to so like go up to the next level in those, begin to... So we talk about people inside the church and blessing people outside the church and same with our meals, but also be intentional about who we are um, spending time with cross-culturally in our blessing and who we're sharing meals with as well. And I, I regularly, just personally, uh, Elora and I think about, think about this question. Like, who, who, are we, who are we inviting into our lives? Who's, who's inviting us in, into their lives? Who are we... Uh, spending time with, in in particular, some are, is, does everyone look like me? Does everyone uh, think like me, or are we getting beyond beyond ourselves in that? And then, as we are pursuing these relationships, conflicts are going to come. We're going to experience some 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 pain, some some growing pain. We're going to. Um, it's it's just. Paul knew that. That's why he, he gave us, it's like an opportunity. This is an opportunity, you're having a conflict. Here's an opportunity, will you walk worthy in this moment? How are we gonna walk through this conflict? Are you gonna walk in a, in a way that's in step with your calling as a Jesus follower, as one new humanity? And I wanna close by reading our verses from Ephesians again and just a couple extra verses as well. As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, 
who is over all and through all and in all. Friends, as, as a church, I, I pray that, that we would be marked by these characteristics as we pursue cross-cultural relationships, as we lean in to being a multi-ethnic church, as we lean in to being that one new humanity. May we keep the peace, the unity of the Spirit. Grace and peace.